The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Ali Moore. This is Ear to Asia. One thing we do know is that into the future, Australia's success will be determined in so many different ways by how well we manage our relations with Asia. Virtually every major issue that confronts Australia is going to require deeper knowledge of and engagement with the region. You know, one aspect of this idea of the Asian century is that it is multipolar, that it is complex and that it requires Australia to be engaged on multiple levels with multiple countries. It permeates a whole range of sectors and industries in ways that I think we're not quite prepared for. In this episode, how Australia's future depends on better understanding Asia. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. How significant is Asia for Australia? At its most eastern extremity, Indonesia, Southeast Asia's most populous nation, is a mere 200 kilometres from the Australian mainland. China remains Australia's most important trading partner, despite recent difficulties in the bilateral relationship. India and Japan are strategic partners by way of the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, or the Quad. And as of 2020, there are more people in Australia of Asian birth than those born in the UK, long Australia's principal source of immigrants. Asia is unquestionably key to Australia's future – And yet we're witnessing a decline in the number of Asian language programs and Asian studies courses available to students in our universities, with one university recently closing down all its foreign language subjects. So if language and culture are the building blocks of understanding, giving us the ability to see the world through different eyes, then what does the downward trajectory of Asia-focused education say about how Australia will navigate its future? The big question is why this disinvestment in Asian studies in Australian higher education? What will the long-term consequences be if the trend is not reversed soon? And what's the real value of being Asia literate to Australian society and its economy? Joining me over Zoom to shed light on the state of Asian studies and its importance to Australia is Indonesia law expert Professor Melissa Crouch from the University of New South Wales and Indonesia political scientist Professor Edward Aspinall from the Australian National University. Together, they're co-authors of the 2023 Asian Studies Association of Australia report Australia's Asia Education Imperative, Trends in the Study of Asia and Pathways for the Future. Melissa, welcome back to Ear to Asia and welcome, Ed. Thanks, Sally. Thanks. Let's start with some context. Melissa, what exactly do we mean when we're talking about Asian studies? Yes, so traditionally Asian studies has been understood as a program or um, discipline within a university. It usually includes a language component as a core aspect of that course, but then also will include subjects around the history, culture, media and society of that particular country. So you have you know, Indonesian studies, Indian studies and so on. More broadly, in recent decades, there has been a turn away perhaps from that model and a mainstreaming of the study of Asia across a wide range of disciplines and faculties at universities in Australia. So, for example, you can find courses here and there on Asia in law faculties, in business um, faculties, in education faculties at universities. So, for students in Australia, while they may undertake an Asian studies degree and they're offered at 11 universities in Australia, it's probably more common for students to be undertaking a dual degree. So, usually undergraduates in Australia would take arts, law or business, science or some sort of combination. And as part of their humanities and social science focus, they could take up Asian studies. But then they would also be studying in another faculty where they may also have um, access to courses on Asia, but they're not necessarily coordinated. And Ed, in that environment, as Melissa's just described it, what does that mean for depth 
of Asian education and also specificity, if you like. Yeah, well, there's always a bit of a trade-off, really. And this is one of the, the sort of dilemmas faced by people in the field that, you know, to really get to know a particular country well requires in-depth study of a, of a language, often a long apprenticeship in that country itself, really focus on, you know, that country's cultural traditions, its history, its political system, and so on. Whereas often for the you know, when students are thinking about their future careers, the job market and so on, they're also looking to develop a particular disciplinary or professional focus. So there is often a, a dilemma, both for students who are thinking about how to develop their own sort of study and then career paths, but also for how we position Asia within Australian universities. The sort of traditional pattern is focus on integrated, very intense programs of Asian studies, whereas the trend over the last couple of decades has really been on positioning Asia more broadly in the curriculum with the risk there and in sometimes the reality, I think, that then that focus on Asia really gets lost. And Ed, that shift in recent decades, to what extent is that a reaction to the sheer diversity of Asia, because we talk about the notion of Asian studies, but for example, China studies is just a completely different ball game to Korean studies or Japanese studies or Indian studies. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That often when we talk of Asian studies, we're really talking about an umbrella term. And for, let's say for academics who focus on the study of a particular region or indeed often a particular country, most of their intellectual interactions will often be with other academic students and so on who do focus on that particular country. So within that broad umbrella term of Asian studies, you do get these universes of their own of people who are focusing on one particular country. And then there's often You know, you'll find the occasional individual scholar who works across countries or across regions, but there's also a lot of opportunity for intellectual exchange, comparison, for example, political scientists working on issues such as democratization or authoritarian rule will often get across countries to compare trends across the region as a whole or within particular sub-regions such as Southeast or Northeast Asia. You're definitely right that it is one of the challenges of the field that the breadth is sometimes rather daunting and poses all these sorts of coordination challenges. Melissa, do you see it the same way? Yeah, look, and I think in our report we openly acknowledge both the positives and negatives of these sort of two approaches, if you like. One, the more traditional Asian studies in-depth approach and the other what we refer to as a sort of post-area studies model. The Asian studies model, I think, as Ed has rightly said, has that consistency and level of depth and expertise that is required for a really long-term study of a particular regional country. I think there are some, uh, there's certainly potential with the post-area studies model in the sense of, you know, mainstreaming the study of Asia throughout our universities is a huge potential opportunity, but there are also significant risks there, I think, risks that it, um, the study of Asia remains ad hoc and also risks that it rises and falls depending upon the leadership of of particular faculties or universities and whether they do or don't support the study of Asia. And we will get to that and the impact also, I guess, of government policies and government funding. But Melissa, if if we look at that bigger question of Asian literacy, what exactly is it? And if you look at the broad Australian population, how Asia literate are we? That's a good question. Asia literacy, we suggest, is the in-depth Knowledge and study of a a country or region, which includes linguistic skills, but it also includes a more holistic sense of the society, the history, politics, economics and culture of that country. So on the second part around how Asia literate we are, there are a number of indicators that we could look to for this. One that we emphasise in our report is uh, both the number of language programs that exist in universities in Australia and whether they have increased or decreased in number over time, uh, as well as the number of students enrolling in these courses over time. Now, 
usually when we think of student enrollment, we talk about equivalent full-time enrollment because obviously some students may be part-time. What we see is a varied picture, but there are some marked trends depending on the particular region. Um, In Australia, South Asian studies has never been particularly large, but if we look at the programs on Hindi studies, while there were four programs in the late 1990s, I think there are now just two in all of Australian universities. When we look at Southeast Asian languages, there's certainly been a decline in terms of many of the languages that are less often studied, so things like Vietnamese or Thai, which did used to exist in uh, some universities in Australia, but have dwindled significantly or sometimes are not offered anymore at all. Uh, But Indonesian is really the one that stands out, I think. And there has been a significant decline. If we look at it in terms of language programs by 2019, I think we had just 14 Indonesian programs left at Australian universities. And by 2022, that had dwindled further to 11. In addition, if we look at enrolments from the early 1990s and compare them with 2019, I think there had been a drop of 63% in enrolments, which is just uh, shocking. But if we turn to Northeast Asia languages, there's certainly a much more positive or complex story there, a different story, where we've seen a growth in the number of students enrolled. And there are a range of reasons for that, and perhaps Ed can go into some of them in more detail. But particularly Korean language studies, uh, Chinese and so on, have seen really significant growth in that area. Well, let's go to that issue of, as Melissa was outlining, of the decline in Southeast Asian studies, I mean, particularly Indonesia. We talked about Hindi. Ed, if I can ask you what on the decline front, so the negative side, I mean, I suppose it's lower enrolments, which in part is feeding into courses not being offered or even being under threat. Why? What's changed from when we were seeing actual increases in the sort of 70s and 80s in Australia? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And and one of the big comparisons here is obviously the languages of Northeast Asia. So in particular, Chinese, but to a lesser extent, Japanese and also Korean versus the languages of Southeast Asia. In in the Australian context, that means especially Indonesian, but also languages like Thai and Vietnamese have virtually disappeared from the Australian university scene. And the key issue here is to understand what is driving these trends in student demand. On the Northeast Asian side of the equation, one big factor is a large number of international students from Northeast Asian countries, many of whom in particular uh, flock into Chinese language courses. So often at Australian universities, large part of the participants in Chinese language courses would be either from the People's Republic of China or from neighbouring countries. Also, of course, the study of Chinese has very much benefited from China's rise in recent decades. The growing economic strength of China in particular has made many students feel that learning Chinese would be a very wise career move. But there's also a much less tangible factor, which is about sort of cultural power or the soft power of particular countries. So one language that is enjoying something of a boom from a relatively low base, but nevertheless enjoying something of a boom in Australia is Korean. And most Korean language teachers will tell us that this is really to do with uh, sort of the drawing power of Korean popular culture internationally these days, especially including amongst many young people in Australia. So the influence of K-pop, of new Korean cinema, and the same with Japanese, of course, you know, the influence of anime and Japanese pop culture. The Southeast Asian languages don't really have that equivalent either economic sort of pulling power or cultural power at the present moment. In fact, something of the worst. So Indonesian really boomed in the, well, really from the 1970s onwards. It uh, enjoyed quite a bit of an uptick in the 80s and 90s when successive federal governments put a big emphasis in sort of the public discourse on building better relations with Indonesia. So there was a big emphasis then on the importance of Indonesia for Australia's economic future. But then we saw political changes taking place within Indonesia itself, the fall of the Suharto government, a period of a lot of political turmoil in Indonesia, and in particular, 
the rise of Islamist terrorist groups for a period in Indonesia, but of course we saw the Bali bombing, attacks on Australians and so on. And it's really from that moment that we see this beginning of this quite precipitous decline in the study of Indonesian at Australian schools and universities. And yet, Ed, arguably that is exactly the time that we should have been increasing our understanding of Indonesia. Yeah, so that's the exact problem. And we see now some of the results of this that we see anecdotally, for example, that the number of graduates being recruited to the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade who have Indonesian language skills is in really steep decline. So this is part of the problem, really, that often when we think about the sort of languages and Asian knowledge that we need in Australia, we often frame this or think of this in terms of strategic national interests, in terms of Australia's economic relations or security interests in the regions. But the system we have for training languages is really a market-driven system. So it's really just left to the the whims and preferences of particular students, and there all sorts of considerations can come into play. And there's no real system, and there hasn't been for decades now, of sort of, you know, systematic, centralised planning, funding support, government direction of the learning of Asian languages in Australia. So the result is that we get these sorts of trends taking place that particularly languages such as Indonesian, which seem to be very important for national interests, are not gaining the emphasis they require. Melissa, when you look at things like, for example, Swinburne University in Victoria, which has closed down all its Asian language programs, are they decisions that are simply made because the students are not there? Or is there also a connection to funding? Or is it sort of chicken and egg? So students aren't there, so funding's not there. Yeah, look, from what we understand at Swinburne, the students were there. It was a fairly calculated decision, I think, by leadership at that university to shift to more of a STEM focus, STEM uh, referring to the sciences and engineering and so on. So if I can come back to your question, you know, about this bigger picture and what is causing it, I think sometimes we can perhaps be a bit too quick to say, well, we just don't have enough students in the classroom and the numbers are declining. Part of that can be changed by government incentives if you have the right structures in society in place, whether it's, you know, beginning with language programs in primary schools and then high schools. You know, students need to have that initial opportunity to explore um, and to get interested in Asia and then are more likely to follow on with deeper studies at university. So there's a pipeline problem, I think, that we have in Australia. Um, But in our report, we're very clear that the landscape at universities in Australia has changed significantly in the last two decades compared to um, prior to that. And it's changed in a couple of ways. One, I think, is that in the last two decades, we've effectively had no federal government policy on Asia literacy. There was something of a sort in 2008 to 2012, but really the more substantial program ended in 2002 and there's been absolutely nothing since. The reason why that matters is that in Australia, universities are often driven by the incentives that government offers. So if there is no policy, if there is no signal, if there is no funding at a federal level, then universities have no reason to pursue that area further. I think the second is is that we've really seen, particularly in the last 10 years, the government adopt a very pro-STEM approach. And often that's come at the expense of the Haas disciplines, the humanities and social sciences, which includes Asian studies, when I think it didn't necessarily have to come at the expense of Haas disciplines. And then this feeds in really to then the signals that universities are getting and the way they have developed In Australia, universities have become much more commercialised and much more bureaucratic. And when things are tight economically, and we have seen this particularly during COVID when for some universities and many in particular, there were really difficult economic decisions to make, 
programs or classes such as in Asian studies, where there are usually relatively small classes of 20 to 30, precisely because you want students to be able to acquire the language skills that they need, and you can only do that in a small classroom setting. But when you compare that with, let's say, a lecture theatre of 400 of economics subjects, uh, it's much easier to simply cost cut by removing the smaller subjects and classes and leaning towards, you know, the big lecture theatre, 400 student subjects. And so I think we've seen that pressure really on the social sciences and humanities um, over the past two decades in a really significant way. And so it's not just that Asian studies and the study of Asia has been under pressure, but that the humanities and social sciences as a whole has been under pressure at Australian universities. But it's interesting also, as noted in your report, just how much of an impact government prioritising can have. And if you look at the National Asian Languages and Studies strategy of the 1990s, uh, Melissa, that had an extraordinary impact, didn't it? And then the moment it was withdrawn, it also had an impact. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there was a study done sort of evaluating the impact that NALSAS had. And, you know, it was very clear that it absolutely did incentivize primary schools and high schools to be able to hire language teachers, which then incentivizes students to take up the opportunity. And then, you know, you hope downstream, it means that there's a greater pool of students who might be interested in pursuing it at a higher degree level. So we have models there that we can use. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again, you can find at Melbourne Asia review.edu.au. I'm Ali Moore and I'm joined by Professor Edward Aspinall from ANU and Professor Melissa Crouch from UNSW. We're discussing the health of Asian studies in Australia. Ed, we were talking before about the growth in the North Asian languages, in particular Chinese and also to an extent Japanese and Korean. But if we look at who is studying, if it's essentially international students accounting for that growth, is it giving us a false sense of security? Well, that's what a lot of people teaching in the Chinese studies area in particular argued to us when we were preparing this report. Now, obviously, we don't want to suggest at all that international students don't make an incredibly valuable contribution to the Australian education system. They're often evaluated in terms of the financial contribution they make. And I think that financial contribution does account for a significant extent for why these programs are booming. But of course, they also make many other contributions, contributing to the intellectual life of Australian universities, their cultural dynamism, and so on. But certainly in terms of producing graduates who are going to go on and develop professional careers in Australia, either in government or in business, the private sector, in academia itself, there is an argument to be made that the significant input or the significant cohort of international students in those programs does give us something of a false impression. So, for example, some of the colleagues we talked to from the China studies world would argue that if you look at recruitment into those sort of elite level programs, such as honours programs, where advanced undergraduates are doing their own research programs using Chinese language materials and so on, there's actually been a decline in the very period where we've seen this big boom in the undergraduate student enrolments. I think Korean and Japanese are probably a little bit different in that these tend to get Um, You know, the motivations of students in those fields are often somewhat different in that you do have this big sort of cultural pull that I mentioned before as one particular driving force. But sure, that's certainly one concern. 
And is there a flip side to that? Because again, as noted in your report, you talk about how over the two decades from 2000, there was big growth in the Northeast Asian languages and the increase in international student numbers accounted for 74% of the overall growth of students. When you have that many international students in a subject, particularly a language subject, what does that do to non heritage students or non-native speakers who may want to learn a language, can they keep up? Well, that really depends upon the extent to which the university providing those courses is able to provide sufficient staff to really stream those programs sufficiently into separate streams of beginners, advanced, background speakers, and so on. Does that happen in Australia? It can happen. It does happen at some universities, but according to many of our informants, it doesn't happen to a sufficient level. So you do get this effect of some students then feeling that this program, you know, that they don't have the ability to keep up and therefore you get this sort of vicious circle developing. So it really does depend on the university and whether the university is willing to invest the sort of resources into these programs, which they sometimes see as very lucrative to support the cohort of students, which is often rather smaller in number. Melissa, what about Asia research in Australian universities and how we compare with other universities uh, in other Western nations? Because we also have to look, I guess, at research links and collaborations with Asian universities. Do we do well on that front? Yeah, look, I think certainly in the past, Australia was known as you know, one of the leaders in the study of Asia, and perhaps among Western countries, it still is. But I think now we have to contend with the fact that we are in the Asian century. We're, in fact, 20 years into the Asian century. You know, Asia is not just on the rise. It has sort of risen, as we've said in our report. Um, and what that means is that across the region, you've got universities who are really upping their game in terms of funding and research capability because of many of the global rankings that exists for universities. And so on one hand in Australia, we have been fortunate. We do have uh, the Australian Research Council and we set out in our report uh, the ways in which that has been a crucial source of funding for academics to pursue large-scale, multi-year projects on Asia and in partnership with academics and colleagues in Asia. But the reality is is that sort of pool of funds, if you like, has been uh, shrinking over time, particularly due to inflation, but also, again, that the Haas disciplines more broadly uh, have seen a kind of shrinking in the overall pie, if you like, that they get of that funding compared to STEM. Um, But I also think we have to look to the region. And if you look at universities in Singapore or other places, you see both governments and universities are investing huge amounts of resources into their research capabilities, which are often focused on the region. And so I think Australia in the future does have to recalibrate and think about how it's going to keep up with some of the fantastic initiatives in research that are happening in universities in the region. So, Melissa, when you look at the funding model that we currently have, how does it work for both courses? So I'm thinking funding for Asian studies and also for research. Sure. So um, in brief, for individual academics, they can potentially apply to the Australian Research Council for individual projects or for collaborative projects. It's a competitive process, usually somewhere between 10 and 15, maybe 16 or 17 percent of applicants are successful. So it's very, very competitive. The likelihood of failure is imminent, um, although there has been you know, a significant sort of success story, if you like, across different disciplines by our scholars who focus on Asia. When you refer to funding for Asian studies programs, I think that's a slightly different sort of perspective in the sense that we're talking about universities as well as the government and the fee structure for students. So one of the changes in the university landscape in Australia um, more recently under the previous government was, of course, a change to the fee structure for students. 
And that has left us with a somewhat contradictory approach when it comes to Asian studies. So on one hand, to take a language now for a student is actually cheaper. And so there are efforts to try and get that message out to students that actually it is cheaper than ever before now to study a language at an Australian university. However, if you're undertaking an Asian studies program more broadly, the subjects that you might take in that are sort of history-based or media media or um, politics, those subjects are now more expensive. So unfortunately, there's a little bit of a contradiction in the current government policy, and that then flows through to how sort of an Asian studies program is funded at the university level. So Ed, when you look at that and you look at the imperative to try and improve the number of people who are interested and keen to study, what sort of policy changes do we need at a government level? The key sort of lesson here about the funding model for both teaching and research is that there is no real point anywhere within our current system in which any major funding agency or the government is determining on a large scale that there should be prioritisation of any sort of the teaching or study of Asia. So the teaching is primarily driven by the market, the ARC, the Australian Research Council, which Melissa says has been a very important funder of Asian studies research, really just judges research proposals on their individual merit. Very ad hoc, isn't it? It depends what comes before them. Yeah. And I mean, the result of previous investment by Australian universities in Asian studies scholarship means that there are a lot of very strong historians, political scientists, legal scholars, and so on working on Asian countries. So there's this strong track record that Melissa referred to. But the point is that there's no real point within our system currently. There's small programs here and there. For example, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade will make these rather short-term grants to promote the study of India or of Indonesia or so on. But at a system-wide level, there's no concerted effort. So if the one change we would advocate, I think, would be that the federal government really needs to step in and resume the leadership role that it once exercised in this field. We don't need to reinvent the wheel here. We have this past period of the National Asian Language and Studies in Schools approach that was implemented in the 1990s and had this really dramatic effect on the teaching of Asian languages and studies at Australian schools and then with flow-on effects for universities. So I think if there was one initiative we could see, it would be some reinvention of that sort of a scheme that would put in support for funding for Australian schools to provide Asian language expertise. Because there are so many problems in the school system. Often the quality of teaching of Asian languages is, um, let's say, not deep, so that students often find it very difficult to either get access to the languages they would like to learn at school or they have difficulty progressing across year levels. So getting that pipeline back running into the universities could be a major priority. Now, you could expand on that. A government that was willing to invest could then also have a similar sort of program to support the study of Asian languages at universities to, you know, a competitive scheme, for example, that universities could bid for to support in particular the lesser taught languages that could then offer incentives for them to employ teaching staff in lesser taught languages provide teaching materials, provide some sort of incentive or scholarship scheme for students. There are many, many possibilities there, but it really requires national leadership of a sort that hasn't really been exercised by any federal government for around 20 years now. And Melissa, the the other point that is, I suppose, connected to that and is made in the report is that In Australia, we've had periods of support for Asia literacy, and then it's being punctuated by inaction, retreat and complacency. So what we actually really need, if we can get policy settings right, we need continuity, don't we? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, what we're really looking for is bipartisan commitment to an Asia literacy strategy. One area where we can see that is the new Colombo plan. So I understand the current government plans to continue that program. So that is a program that has 
really shifted the game in terms of mobilising large numbers of undergraduate students from Australian universities to go and study in Asia on a scale that we've never really seen before. Now, on one hand, it has been and is a fantastic program. It has given the opportunity to many students who perhaps might not have been able to afford it or perhaps wouldn't have thought of doing something like that to incorporate it as part of their degree. But generally speaking, most of those programs have been short term. So, for example, a student might go for two weeks to Indonesia or Japan or Singapore, do an intensive course, and then they come back to their university in Australia. There is, I should say, a separate part of the program that does fund students for a more extended stay, which is great, but that's a very limited um, pool of students that they offer that to. Um, So, on one hand, we've seen that it it does really mobilise students to go into the region, but I think what we're lacking is that For many students, and I see this at my own university, when they come back, while they are energised, they're enthused, they want to engage, they they wish they had known more about the language or something about the language before they went and they're keen to potentially pursue it further, uh, sometimes the universities that they come back to simply don't offer programs in that area. So, for example, my own campus doesn't offer Indonesian language studies. And so it then becomes very difficult for students to try and pursue their passion further in this area if the structures don't exist back here in Australia. So, in other words, we need a more coordinated approach. Absolutely. And because we are a federal system, we, you know, there is a federal government, we've got state governments, we need them to be coordinated. But as we've emphasised as well, the responsibility is also on universities. And so I think while policy needs to be led by the federal government, it very much needs to include a range of stakeholders. And that's why this issue is complex, because it does involve, you know, both universities, but also the education sector more broadly. And how do you get that, Melissa, if it's not just in the, I suppose, the ball is not entirely in the government's court. I mean, clearly funding is essential and underpins it, but it also needs particular attitudes from universities. Do you think that if the money's there, the attitude will be there or the the approach will be there? Look, funding is certainly part of it, but I think it does also require leadership with knowledge and appreciation of Asia and of Australia's place in the region. We do certainly see that at some universities where they have appointed academics who do have deep expertise in Asia to their sort of international division and where they spearhead some of the programs and uh, joint degrees and engagements with other countries. But that's probably relatively rare when you look across the 40 or so universities in Australia. And there are universities now that have vice chancellors who are not from a university background or who are not from Australia and so may simply have not been exposed to or have an appreciation for the deep connection that Australia has to the region. Ed, you said before that we're not looking to reinvent the wheel. We have the example of how things can work from going back to up until about the year 2000 and where we were doing a lot better on this front. When you look at what's required and what you've been talking about, you've both been talking about financially and structurally, do you think they're big asks? Not really, not when we think about, you know, the scale of the challenges ahead of us and the enormity of the opportunities that Australia has in the region. One thing we do know is that into the future, Australia's success will be determined in so many different ways by how well we manage our relations with the region in virtually every sphere you can think of, everything from Obviously, the traditional areas like security, economic relationships, trade and so on, but also these emerging areas like AI or pandemic uh, management, uh, informal people flows, virtually every major issue that confronts Australia is going to require deeper knowledge of and engagement with Asia, Asian countries across a whole broad array of fronts, not just high-level meetings between political leaders or security leaders and so on, but across a sort of a societal level involving people in the arts, culture, in media, and of course, in many sectors of business. So I guess when we're thinking about sort of costs and benefits, we shouldn't just be focusing on the potential costs. And 
a colleague in Western Australia has calculated that if we were to try and provide support for Australian schools, for an Asian language strategy for Australian schools, it would amount to something like you know, $18 to $20 per Australian student per year. So it's not a huge sum in terms of the massive investment that Australia makes in its education system nationally, but it does require that bigger picture thinking and that level of political commitment. And Melissa, without that, what are the risks to this country? It just went through how incredibly important it is. But if we stand still, the rest of the world is moving, isn't it? Absolutely. And, you know, one aspect of this idea of the Asian century is that it is multipolar, that it is complex, and that it requires Australia to be engaged on multiple levels with multiple countries in the region. And so it does, as Ed has said, permeates a whole range of sectors and industries in ways that I think we're not quite prepared for. We know that some of the business lobby groups in Australia have said that they want more graduates with skills in Asian studies. The government itself in some of its graduate foreign affairs programs has also said that they're not getting the number or level of graduates who have Asian literacy skills that they would like to see. So we kind of know that there's demand out there, but unfortunately at the moment there's a disconnect between perhaps the emphasis that Australian universities and the government has and the kind of skills that we want our graduates to develop. And Melissa, if this report of yours, which is the fifth in a series since 1970, if this report can't make a difference, what will? There are many groups, I think, at the moment who are in support of this agenda. And so that's one thing that does give me hope. I think one of the changes in the landscape in more recent decades is that we do have a stronger set of policy institutes that are not necessarily connected to universities, or they may have some informal or semi-formal connections, but institutes that also see and get Australia's place in the region and that are also actively engaged on this issue. So I think we're aware that we're one of a number of voices and we hope that more sort of voices will be added to this call to commit to Asia literacy. Ed, do you share Melissa's optimism? I would like to. I mean, I I think one of the points we can agree on as well is that there are voices within government who can see the bigger picture and the relevance of the sort of arguments we're making and who have themselves, for example, committed to learning Asian language on a personal basis. So we know there is potentially a receptive audience there. It's just that we know any incoming federal government has a very crowded policy agenda, lots of groups fighting to get there you know, their suggestions and proposals on the table. It's just a matter of whether we can get this national priority as we see it back onto the policy agenda. And sooner rather than later. And certainly your report makes that case and the case for urgency very well. Melissa Crouch and Ed Aspinall, thank you so much for talking to Ear to Asia. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. It's been a great pleasure. Our guests have been Professor Melissa Crouch from the University of New South Wales and Professor Edward Aspinall from the Australian National University. Their report is called Australia's Asia Education Imperative, Trends in the Study of Asia and Pathways for the Future. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify or Google Podcasts. Please rate and review us. It helps new listeners find the show and put a good word in for us on social media. This episode was recorded on the 7th of February 2023. Producers were Calvin Parham and Eric Van Bemmel of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2023, the University of Melbourne. I'm Ali Moore. Thanks for your company.